Welcome uh, to this edition of Let's Talk Sustainability. Uh, today we're going to cover the topic of just transition and I've got several guests, so it's a plot twist today. If you're someone who tunes in each time, usually we, we generally have one, but uh, I'll explain a little bit why this is different, but uh, we've you've, we've had guests from Resource for the Future before. They're a, a favorite NGO partner of ours, and we, we very much value their opinion. Uh, let me just give you the quick format, and then we're going to have each one of our guests kind of go around the room. But for starters, remember this is no slides, no notes. This is meant to be an open dialogue. OK, and at some point we'll cut in with the voiceover after we've been here for a bit and open it up for Q&A. And so if you're watching, uh, you can type in your question and then Marie Kekebeck will will read read the ones that we can get to during that time after we've been here about 30 minutes. OK, and so just you can put those in at any time and she'll keep an eye on that. And who knows, maybe we'll answer some of them as we go. And so uh, one of the things for my esteemed guests from Resources for the Future, uh, I will ask for you to briefly introduce yourself, okay? And you know, right before this, I said I like to find out what we can't read about folks on LinkedIn, and then everyone quickly looked at their LinkedIn and realized that they could probably write more on LinkedIn. So the world is their oyster. So I'm going to let them introduce and and give me a fun fact about yourself that maybe most people don't know. And so I'm going to call people out on the order on the screen. Alan, you're first. Then Daniel, and then Molly. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for inviting us, Allison. Um, it's always great to uh, speak to and such a large audience too. This is, is wonderful and, and an industry audience is also wonderful. So um, so I'm a senior fellow here at Resources for the Future. I've been here for a very long time because uh, it's so much fun. And um, uh, I'm also head of our industry and fuels decarbonization program. And fun fact is uh, maybe on Saturday, those of you in DC can come to hear my uh, rock band play at the VFW in Tacoma Park. Awesome, that's so much fun, Alan. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. I I'm, I will have to get the information out, but I would love to see you in your band. All right, the, it, it, I would remind it every time I get to talk to you, just how delightful it is to hear from you. You've got such a great sense of humor. Okay, Daniel. Hi, Allison. Thanks so much. And um, just want to second my thanks to you and Baker Hughes for, for having us. Really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm a fellow at RFF. I also direct our Equity in the Energy Transition Initiative. Uh, I do research on all sorts of things related to how the energy system is changing and how that might affect people uh, and what solutions we might uh, look to to prevent um, negative impacts of uh, changing energy system. Um, fun fact about me is, uh, like Alan, I'm a musician. I was a music major in college, and um, my brush with fame is that when I was in college, I was in a band with Lin Manuel Miranda of uh, Hamilton fame, who's now gone on to like conquer the world. So um, I can't get you tickets to any of his shows though, because we're not in touch. <laughs> well, I'm glad mm -hmm. so that you knew that that was the follow up. Okay, but I, if you hadn't brought up the music thing, I was going to bring it up because I think most people know that. I too went to music school and had a first career in music. So that's my fun fact for anyone who didn't get that data point, but I'm, I'm fairly, I put that out in front. And so Molly, please say you're also into music so that we can have our own <laughs> band as a result of this. You know, it's funny because I kid you not, my fun fact in my mind was music related, <laughs> but nice. so I'm Molly Robertson. I'm a, a research associate at Resources for the Future. I work mostly on uh, issues related to the power sector and also environmental justice. Um, and my fun music fact that we didn't plan a theme for is that when I was in elementary school, I had a dream of being a drummer. I really wanted to be a drummer in a rock band. Uh, and somehow that turned into me playing the oboe for eight years. I don't know when that happened, but <laughs> much less cool, uh, but it, it was still a good time. So yeah, another another musician at heart. Excellent. OK, so so by my count, I'm a bass player. I can also play piano and numerous other instruments, but those are my main two. We've got an oboist. Daniel, you're a guitarist. Yes. OK, Alan, what are you? Keyboard. Nice. This it'd be a strange band with the oboe in it, but it would be a band all the same. All right. OK, so I won't get too indulgent on music. Um, uh, let me first op like like level the playing field for everybody who's here. So. 
this this universe of sustainability, energy transition, just transition, there's a lot of terms and they can be kind of confusing because they get turned around a whole lot. And so I kind of want to start there. So so a, a lot of the time you hear people say decarbonize. OK, and uh, RFF friends, you guys know as much as I do, that term came about um, via the uh, environmental NGO community as as a meaning to literally decarbonize the energy sector and phase out fossil fuels. OK, and so that is by and large, like like keep that in mind as we're discussing that today. Do you guys agree, disagree with that use of that term? Yeah, that sounds right to me. OK, all right. OK, I just want to make sure we level set on that. Now, oftentimes people say in house and, and I hear it in our industrial sector, they say decarbonize is a way to remove emissions. So it's less about the, the fuel source or the energy source and more about emissions reduction. And so I just want it just to everybody be mindful that there is nuance to how those terms are used. And so so that's the first one. And also when people say the energy transition, that's generally we're talking about a transition to a lower carbon state here. OK, now um, let's open it up for my my friends here, Daniel, Alan or Molly. Um, when we say just transition, there's a lot of different ways that that term is used out in the world. Is there one canonical uh, definition or how would you guys explain it? I'll just let whomever wants to jump in. I can I can give it a first crack and then happy for others to to correct me or build on it. I mean, I don't think there is a canonical definition. Uh, first of all, you know, when you look in like the research literature and the policy world, sometimes people mean different things. Um, but I guess for, you know, when I think about the idea of just transition, there are kind of two, maybe three main elements uh, that come with it. The first is that um, a just transition would ensure that the people in the places that currently depend on the fossil fuel sector for jobs and tax revenue and economic activity, that those communities aren't like left behind uh, as we move towards cleaner energy sources. That's the first point. The second point would be that um, an energy transition or a just transition would ensure that the people who are unable to access energy affordably today can more affordably access it in the future. Uh, so enhancing energy access. And then there's some other stuff you can stick on there um, that, that sometimes gets included. The main one is, is related to this topic of environmental justice, uh, which Alan and Molly have, have worked on more than me. And um, environmental justice uh, is the idea that, you know, in the past, certain communities, especially communities of color, have been disproportionately exposed to pollution uh, from the energy system and from other parts of uh, the economy. Think of, you know, waste disposal or something like that. And so uh, in some people's definition, and I think it's appropriate here, a just transition would seek to kind of fix those environmental justice problems and not like introduce new environmental justice problems from the introduction of new cleaner energy technologies. Right now, Alan or, or Molly, from your perspective, do you want to add anything? I mean, you can subtract too, but like I assume there's one RFF position here. Um, I could uh, maybe offer a caution that's been on yeah. my mind a lot lately, which is the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling. Um, there is in Justice 40 and community benefits plans, uh, there is a preferences for uh, disadvantaged community protections. And I just wonder if some of these are gonna be challenged uh, after the Supreme Court decision. Uh, and that would be uh, pretty wild. You, you're saying that on the basis of establishing uh, precedent? Establishing, well, there's already a precedent to, let's say, correct wrongs. Uh, but you could argue that the treatment will not be equal. And uh, so what does the Supreme Court do with that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Molly, anything from you? Yeah, just to add to what Daniel said, I, I mean, I think that we think about um, these additions of, of polluting industries or, or exposure to environmental hazards as something that we're introduced in the past when these facilities were built, but as they continue to operate, communities feel like there are these cumulative burdens that are being piled on top of each other. And um, it's really important to think not just about 
you know, a small marginal unit of uh, additional burden to a community, but what their historical burden has been and how those all contribute together to the kinds of pollution and hazards that they face. Yeah, you know, I um, I had the fortune last year to attend COP27, okay, and it was the first time I had attended a meeting like that, especially being there in person, right? And so, so a lot of the, um, a lot of where you guys focus is, is very domestic here, but like, I know you guys think about the world, right? You know, one of the the audience that we have here today is is global in reach because we, as Baker Hughes, operate in about 120 company uh, countries. So the let's put this in, let's frame this up in the global context, right? So when we look at what's happening in, in a world that's heating up, okay, by and large it's getting warmer, okay. Maybe some areas get a little colder at times, but but by and large, um, we're seeing the just transition becoming more and more prevalent, but I think we're, we, you hear the term environmental justice around it. In the context of the nations that contribute the least towards emissions, carrying the heaviest burden, okay? You know, first I'll open it up and, and get your thoughts on that. I mean, I, the thing that was so powerful in going there in person was realizing that the delegates who go to that event get three minutes, okay, to make their case for their nation, okay? And that's kind of mind boggling three minutes. And in the three minutes, they can say a lot, particularly the island nations last year. But um, but I'd love to get some of your thoughts in that broader context. Like, where do you see the biggest um, risk globally for uh, having a just transition where we, we really address the energy trend? How do we do this in a smart way? Where do you see the biggest negative impact? Well, I think I mean there are so many ways to answer that. Uh, you know, the 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 way you frame the question makes me think about you know low income uh, nations that are exposed to you know climate hazards, sea level rise, um, heat waves, crop failures, things like that. Um, you know, I think the those challenges are you know people are aware of them, right? At COP meetings, there's a lot of discussion about them uh, with climate finance and loss and damage, and they're contentious. Um, but when I think about sort of just transition, I mostly think about the energy system and okay. how the energy system is going to change and how those changes might negatively affect places. So you think about, you know, nations that are very heavily dependent on oil extraction for, you know, for revenue and jobs, or parts of the United States that are heavily dependent on oil or coal. Um, and, and so that's how I think about just transition topics. I think about them as sort of separate from the sort of climate damage topics that um, that are probably most prevalent uh, at, at COP. Okay, that's great. That's great to have that clarity behind that. Yeah, I, I learn something new every day too, and I, I very much appreciate your your perspective on that. Because for me, the muddy the waters get a little muddy because we hear so many of as we started out, so many of the terms used in different ways, and and sort of applied in context that maybe that wasn't their original intent, right? So yeah, uh, so yeah. Well, I'm well, just curious, how, how how are you thinking about it? Like, do, when you think about just transition, do you think about all of the climate related impacts as part of that term or like, because because um, that'd be a really interesting way to sort of expand the scope? Well, I mean, as we think about the energy trilemma specifically, right, is and when we think about making sure that we can continue to power power the world in an energy transition, but you don't want to you don't want to move energy out of a system too soon in the transition if there's not a fallback. And then how does that impact the community in the transition jobs? How does it impact um, natural resources that, that might need to be used in a, in a switch, et cetera? So there's a lot of different ways, but communities are very much impacted. And so we tend to think of it in terms of let's not leave anybody behind or without power. A leapfrog might do just that, right? If we tried to leapfrog and like they weren't ready for it, there might be more um, impoverished parts of the community that still have no access to energy if it was more money. Okay, and then do we damage the jobs, the economy, if we pull out or come back in too quickly without giving it some thought? So um, that's kind of kind of the framing right now. But I will admit we're kind of in our in our sort of earlier days of framing this up. And, and how we want to think about it globally, because we work in so many parts of the world that um, that there is that nexus between what's happening daily on climate and then 
you know, on the loss and damage side, but then also um, how we're moving in and out of areas that that might be getting energy for the first time. And so I think, Alan, you were going to add something. Well, uh, yeah, I, I was going to talk about uh, solutions. Yeah. Uh, to this, it is very, you know, the developing world needs to uh, bolster their electrification, for instance. So many people are energy poor. And so, how to do that in a sustainable, decarbonized way is absolutely critical. And we're pretty much failing miserably at that, uh, with India being the biggest uh, problem child. And um, so financial mechanisms that reward uh, like offsets that you can actually bank on yeah. uh, that reward countries and companies for um, uh, using uh, for building power by building it in clean, clean ways uh, to try to tilt these countries to uh, uh, decarbonize even as they electrify and build other uh, energy uses up, uh, that's that that's that's what we should be doing a lot more thinking about. Yeah, I mean, what what do you what do you think? I mean, there's a lot of I throw this out to everybody uh, here because I think you all probably have a perspective that's nuanced. The there's a lot of conversations that go on about picking winners and losers, right? And and what constitutes a clean energy? You know, is it all renewables? Like, is there a future for nuclear in managing and buffering against the risk of, a, of having a just transition, right? Because the parts of the world want to even phase out nuclear. And so I'd love to get your thoughts specifically on, on what's in the frame. What, what should we be considering on that technology side? And then we should put a bookmark in and talk about offsets because you brought the O word to the dialogue. Yeah. OK, so we got to come back well, to that. Okay. Well, I'll just jump in here. Uh, all of the above. I mean, and this will get us into a discussion about the EJ issues. Yeah. But, you know, we need hydrogen. We need CCUS, which is so attractive. And even in places like India, if the cost can be defrayed by developed countries, uh, because it keeps the existing fossil fuel infrastructure in place uh, and allows for uh, cleaner uh, energy production. I mean, it's just critical. So CCUS, hydrogen, you know, all, all the options um, that, that are possible. In some areas, of course, it's, they're more problematic and more expensive and so on. But um, yeah, that's, that's the way I would go. All right, Molly, what do you think? Yeah, just since Alan raised it um, to kind of pepper in the environmental justice perspective yeah. here. I think that there's um, some conversations about, you know, what the prioritization of different technologies should be based on not just their ability to reduce carbon emissions. So there are other impacts that technologies might have, co-pollutants that affect particularly the local areas where those technologies are being used. Um, exactly like Alan mentioned, there's a benefit to using existing infrastructure in terms of reducing costs, but there are serious concerns about how relying on existing infrastructure in the short term may prolong uh, the use of fossil technologies beyond when ideally they would be used from an economy-wide decarbonization perspective. So I think that there's a lot of debate about what the priority should be and in a resource constrained environment, how do you prioritize different technology types in the stack? Even if you accept Alan's premise that we need to be using all of our tools, what percent of your resources should be going to what tools is a really important question and a place where a lot of communities and even within communities may disagree. I think um, Daniel kind of pointed this out a little bit earlier, but you can have even within a community a labor contingent that strongly wants a technology to stay and a resident contingent that strongly wants the industry to leave due to its environmental impacts. So even just saying a community advocate doesn't mm -hmm. cover the full list of perspectives in a community. So <clears throat> there's a lot of <laughs> different things to consider there. That's a great point. OK, and one that I, I haven't heard anybody bring up in the conversations around um, this topic or as we've had other other energy transition talks come through that like just put a pin on this for a second everybody 
she basically said that a company or a technology advocate, like there may be a community of people who say, we want to do this, it's our livelihood, right? And and not framing that as industry, because sometimes it isn't even industry that's at the helm of that, okay? And then you might have the residents having a different opinion, all right? And so that's a really good um, way, to, way to kind of think about the tension that you've got in how you have a transition. It's, it's so, we talk a lot about stakeholder engagement for this area, and, and I can't think of an area that is, is more critical than transitioning an energy system, right? Is to have that stakeholder engagement. So Daniel, thoughts? I wanna come back to you on, on technology, could be offsets. I mean, like already we've run the gambit, so. Yeah, well, I'm staying away from offsets if I can, but um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> You know, I was thinking about um, this trip I took to New Mexico a few months ago, and I was in the Four Corners region of New Mexico, which has a really long history of environmental injustice. There was all this uranium mining that happened there uh, in the 19, you know, 40s and, and later that, you know, led to cancers among all sorts of workers, especially among the Navajo Nation. There's all this mining waste that's left over there. Um, and when you're in that area, there are so many different stakeholders with so many different perspectives. There are people in that area who totally want more nuclear energy. And then yeah. there are just down the road, you know, uh, people who have lung cancer because they breathed in, you know, uranium when they were working in the mines and they weren't given proper protections. There are similar debates over, you know, um, even things like geothermal energy um, and carbon capture. Um, and so like when you're in these communities, there are like different levels of environmental issues that people are thinking about. Some people are focused on the climate issue above all else. And then some people are focused on the local pollution issues above all else. And, and those two views, sometimes they, you know, line up with each other and they can work together, but sometimes they don't. And um, I think that's like a critical thing to keep in mind when you're approaching any of these new decarbonization technologies. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, uh, without realizing it, D Daniel picked out a, a part of the world that's near and dear to my heart. I spent many, many years working for the, the great state of New Mexico, working for a senator. And that was a big issue, even before the terms just transition or, or environmental justice were really prevalent terms. That was such a, a core issue because you've got the nexus with indigenous communities there that is so important, okay, but yet struggling on the sort of economic uh, you know, pulling out of poverty in some areas, but yet still maintaining an energy base that doesn't hurt people, so to speak, in terms of their lung function, because there was a lot of coal plants around four, four corners that were really uh, another another really big issue for that part of the, the world. So so I appreciate what you're saying there. The um, This is right about the time that I'm, I'm cognizant uh, that, that maybe we break for a few quick questions uh, from Marie, and then we'll see where the dialogue uh, takes us again. Okay, so Marie, if you are ready with any questions, I would invite you to voice over. Absolutely, great. Thank you for the dialogue. So we have a couple questions. Um, first of all, one comes from Kara Trish. The idea and terminology of a just transition has been around for a while, but as we've discussed today, there isn't one agreement on what specifically it is or necessarily exactly how we'll achieve it in the industry. From RFF's research and perspective, what, what are the activities that should be prioritized for an energy technology company like Baker Hughes? It's a good one. I just leave it to you. <laughs> well, I... Alan, I would love to hear what um, your thoughts on this with the um, with the Department of Energy hubs and the community benefit agreements and stuff like that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about too. Uh, so, all right, I'll take the handoff. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Baker Hughes, you're in at least uh, the Halo hub and you may be in others that we don't know about. Um, so you're, you're facing uh, the legacy of uh, poor interactions with the oil industry, oil and gas industry with communities, and your application for hub money uh, weights community benefits plans at 20%. Mm -hmm. So I would love to know how Halo and others that you're involved with are stepping up to this challenge. 
Um, I think DOE, the Department of Energy, thinks of the communities as somehow homogeneous. Yeah. And and not in in knockdown drag out competition, uh, which in some communities uh, that would be the case. And in any event, uh, who gets negotiated with in these plans? Uh, how the communication takes place? Is it the usual industry uh, view that we'll tell you all this information and you know, we'll be very forthcoming one way, but not so forthcoming the other way when the community wants some um, uh, responsibility taken and some costly uh, activities taken by the developer, in this case of hydrogen hubs, to protect the community uh, more than um, than maybe the, uh, uh, the hub consortium wants. So I think this is a huge challenge. And a company like Baker Hughes, which has so much prestige and is in so many places, um, could, well, I'd just be interested to see, you know, how far down this route the applications have, have gone to, uh, to promise to be accountable. Yeah, you know, this is a great question. And I happen to know that several of my home colleagues one of which is two doors down. And if I get this wrong, he's going to come and shake his fist at me. <laughs> I do have a risk in answering this. But the, uh, with the hubs right now, so much of it is about just getting in the group itself. OK, and so now we're in um, we're in a fairly significant number of hubs. So we are in Halo uh, and we want to be a part of as many as, as we can. But I will say to your point, uh, not all are at that from what I can tell, and I'll be interested after after I, I, I speak to these guys afterwards on this question, in determining on that engagement part for the 20% and how they interact with the community. I have heard less about that and more about how, how do you put together the best group of partners to position the hub in the first place? Because I do think, Al, there is this perception that there's there's kind of an equal weighting, but there is not, right? And there's a lot more focus on, on um, DEI topics and environmental justice, not just in the hubs, but in other of the DOE programs now. And so it's it's worth knowing that's a big, big part of the price for entry just to be competitive right now. So thank you for bringing that up. You, you've thrown down a challenge that I'm going to accept and going back <laughs> and actually like like really focusing that because while we've positioned ourselves to be in as many as we can, Right, there are going to be some 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 that we'll put more weight on because that we think they've got a, a better chance at it going mm -hmm. forward. But we we do treat them all with with this equal level of respect well, and consideration. Well, Allison, while you're doing that, yeah, uh, the, the DOE has set an extremely low bar in terms of transparency of what's go what's in these applications uh, and um, how they're looking at them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, CBI, okay, fine, but uh, it's gotten taken to basically total secrecy. Uh, and on certainly on these kinds of plans, I'd like to see the companies be more forthcoming and the hubs themselves be more forthcoming. And of course, DOE, I'm always asking them to be more forthcoming. Uh, but there's been like a total news blackout and oh, okay. um, there doesn't have to be on some of these issues. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, this is an area that, um, I, if I can shamelessly plug, we did make Newsweek's most transparent companies list this year, which is great. Okay, great. so we do believe <laughs> here in this company that in, in transparency and in, in what we're doing, knowing that any application that is submitted basically to to the DOE it, in some way, aside from proprietary technology, can be open to to public and Freedom of Information Act. But I know that that's not necessarily the case because there's a lot of that proprietary lens that gets overlaid. So your point is well taken and your ask for transparency. I, I made some notes on the back of a card here so I can <laughs> take this away as we as we think about this going forward. So I appreciate your candor, uh, Al, on this. Um, other, other, anything else from Daniel or, or Molly on this? Okay, you feel sad. Okay, you're feeling quite full and satisfied by his answer. Okay, so uh, Marie, do we have another question that you wanted to um, 
wanted to raise right now? I have a couple yeah. of follow up ones. After yes, that. Uh -huh. we do actually. So um, we have a question from uh, Marin Lopez Litterman and it's once uh, one of the most important pieces to make the energy transition is people and all of us are continuously learning about it. However, what are the key skill sets that people should strive to have? How can we cascade this skill set down, um, you know, leveraging knowledge to impact the basic levels in society and boost new ideas from them? So really, what are the skills to help enable a just transition? Great question. Great question. Yeah, I, I want to hear, Allison, what what you have to say about that, uh, but I, I can try to answer it first. I mean, we. Um, I want to hear my, what Molly my... has to say about that. <laughs> oh, Molly. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've actually done some research um, in, in my initiative on the skills that um, the current fossil fuel workforce has and the extent to which those skills match other types of jobs that are growing in fossil fuel dependent regions. And the current skills match is, is not very good. Uh, a lot of the jobs that pay as well as, you know, jobs working on oil rigs or, you know, petroleum engineering um, or working at a coal fired power plant, those jobs are not easily transferable to other growth sectors of the economy. And so that's a real challenge. I think one of the opportunities of technologies like CCS, geothermal energy, hydrogen, is that they could, you know, utilize a lot of those existing skills um, that people have in fossil fuel communities. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity there uh, to, to match those skills up, but there's also going to be displacement and there's going to be challenges and there's going to be retraining that's needed. And the types of retraining that people will need, it's going to depend on their preferences and it's going to depend on whether they want to stay where they are or whether they want to move. Uh, it's going to depend on, you know, what types of economic growth opportunities exist in the places where they live or the places where they want to move. Not every place that's a fossil fuel powerhouse today is going to remain an energy powerhouse tomorrow. You know, some communities might, uh, you know, try to grow other sectors like tourism or uh, recreation economy or other, you know, areas like that. So I think we shouldn't prejudge, you know, what communities are going to become in a world where there's less fossil energy production happening. I think we need to kind of identify um, what solutions make the most sense in what place and then support local communities in building up whatever solutions they see as most viable for them and then retrain people to fit, you know, those jobs that are coming in the future. But I mean, I'm not here saying that it's going to be easy or simple because it's not. Right. Molly, do you want to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, just to kind of take uh, responsibility a bit for our own field, I think that researchers and policymakers also have a bit of a learning curve on how to engage across multiple different stakeholder types. Just like you were saying, Allison, how do you build community buy-in? There are a lot of kind of historical policy developments where groups have been excluded, and those groups have a really deep seated distrust of a lot of these processes because of that kind of historic exclusion. So building that trust back, helping res us, us as researchers trying to build a common base of research and knowledge that speaks to the issues that environmental justice advocates are worried about, economic issues that we've always been worried about, and the whole spectrum of impacts of different approaches and technology types. I think we have to really broaden our open-mindedness to what outcomes are important and what needs to be considered. Um, and that's just, that's not even on the worker or the labor side like Daniel covered, but just folks like us who are researching this and thinking about this, I think we need to kind of beef up our community engagement skill set and make sure we're thinking about all of the impacts because this transition, if it happens as quickly as we want it to, um, that those questions need to be answered quickly and we need to kind of build those skills quickly as well. That's great. The, uh, your perspectives are coming at it from different angles, but but both excellent points to make. So uh, I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a storm that has just started and there was a big gigantic thunderclap and so it got really dark. And so if you lose me, Marie is not in the region and she will take over. OK, so I just want to put that out there. It just came on. Happy to do so. OK, Marie, just just wanted to be prepared. 
So, yeah. so on, on the skills issue, okay, so this is a really great topic because that's actually something that Marie on the voiceover is working on and that we've been looking at inside the company because, Daniel, uh, we see this as it's not a one for one on, on the skills, okay? And, and when we've gone out for specific technology roles, the market's really constrained still because people are still, we've got a shortage of people with experience in certain areas like carbon capture, for instance, or engineering. Um, we, we happen to have somebody who, who used to be on my team who's great on MOFs, if you know what metal organic frameworks are, but that's not a huge community, okay? But that's a community that's really important in the energy transition. And so, so there's this other idea too, that got kind of bantered around for a while in our corner of the world. And it, and the term upskilling was applied. And I remember the first couple of times I heard that, and then I used that and I got really furious feedback on this. And so when you look at highly technical workforces, whether we've got someone out on a rig site or in an office, these are highly technical people. They are highly skilled. So to use that term to upskill them implies that they had a base level of non-technical skills, which is simply not the case. So I don't want people to think that as we talk about transitioning our sector and this kind of a, a skills base, that in some way we're not up to the challenge. It's more so how do you take the, the way people think and put it on a new problem set? Okay, and so that's really how we're thinking about it. And that's a big part of what, what Marie uh, Kekebeck, uh, who's here with us, it has been working on is really looking at that connection of capability building across our company. And then thinking more broadly, how does that intersect with the broader energy and jobs community outside of a company like ours? And how competitive would we be? And then ultimately we'll get to where we need people and that will dictate the terms of how and where we hire based on where we can get talent. Because I will say from my perspective of reporting on emissions right now, greenhouse gas emissions, the um, uh, while we'd like to be able to have people around the world who have a lot of that technical competence, we don't see the same competence level in every single company or country right now. So that's another piece of this. So, uh, so that was that was great. I would like to kind of take this back to um, the the nexus of technology and jobs. Okay, is there any technology and or part of the labor workforce that you that you think were woefully un, unprepared or underprepared for in the energy transition that you see that could actually create energy poverty in areas that are seeking to really advance the energy transition? No. Well, the one thing comes to mind, and Brianna Lissy's on the line, and she was um, with me when when I was in New Mexico. You know, one of the shortages that we heard about in New Mexico, and that I've heard about anecdotally elsewhere, is just like a shortage of uh, tradespeople um, in the United States, and uh, an insufficient pipeline of training uh, for the trades for people to build out the electricity infrastructure that's going to be needed in a you know more electrified world uh, this includes things like long distance transmission but it also includes things like you know installing heat pumps in people's homes um, which are which are going to be really important technologies and you know judging from the admittedly anecdotal evidence that I that I have you know there's a extreme shortage of people who are able to you know, to do this work right now. You know, there are long wait times um, and insufficient pipeline of people kind of making their way into the trades uh, to do all the work that needs to be done. Um, so that's that's kind of a US focused perspective. Um, I'm sure there are other challenges, uh, you know, outside of the US and within it too, but that's the first one that comes to my mind. Thoughts from the rest of the group? No, you took the words out of your mouth. So, so you know, in that, in that area of some of the communities that are still sort of thinking about maybe maybe we have a chance to 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 leapfrog a little bit, right? You know, I see a disconnect sometimes between government ambition on behalf of a country and that of what is really happening on the ground. Okay. Does that give you concern as three people who work in this area of just transition or environmental justice? Do you think it's as big of a problem as I worry that it is? The dis between, disconnect between government and community. 
Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure what you're driving at. I mean, there's local government and community, there's state government and community, there's federal government. What are you focused on there? Well, I, I left it open to let you decide. I know it's more interesting that well, way. Well, um, I guess I could talk a little bit about our experience in the uh, Intermountain West. Uh, there's a big project that we finished up as one of several uh, academic uh, institutions, if we count us that way, um, looking at pathways to a low carbon future for the Intermountain West. And there, the focus was exclusively well, there's a large technology focus, but from a government perspective, the focus was on the state and the federal roles. Because the feds, you know, have all these, you know, major policies with the, the uh, in Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act that are going to ultimately land at the local level. And the states have uh, revenue sharing. I mean, Daniel knows more about this than I do. Uh, a lot of revenue sharing with uh, local levels and have their own laws that local uh, activities are subservient to, uh, like in a place like Texas in particular. Uh, so maybe the locals get the short end of the of the stick on that, and they're reactive. Uh, whereas you know locals in terms of uh, land use and permitting. Uh, maybe could have an outside role, outsized role, but they lack the technical capacity and the institutional capacities to take aggressive uh, stances on the development in their own communities. So there is a there is a dilemma there. Yeah, that's a good point. Resource constraint. Daniel, yeah. do you want to uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean that's a it's a huge issue all over the country in the and this may be true outside of the United States as well, but there's so much work that needs to be done um on the energy transition. Um and in the United States, there's a ton of money getting funneled towards the energy transition and a ton of money getting funneled toward or that's available to local communities to support their efforts. But it's like they're kind of getting drowned with all of, of this opportunity. And a lot of the times they don't even have like enough capacity to go to the capacity building session to try to figure out how to write the grant to get the money <laughs> to do the energy project. Yeah, um, and so it's it's a real constraint right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so as well. I mean, we even feel that internal in a company like, I think outside of this company, people would say, oh, big companies have tons of resources. Yes and no. We suffer from like the same thing <laughs> that communities happen at various times because you've got to think about all of your stakeholders and whether or not you've got enough people to cover what they're supposed to normally cover and then the additional things, right? And so to think about that in the constrained universe that the people who work for local governments in particular, that's that's a really tough one. So I want to, um, we're, we're rounding the end uh, and, it, and I want to take something back here that Molly had said, she brought up the skill set around stakeholder engagement. So uh, I'm going to let Marie ask one more question, but before I have her close this out, Stakeholder engagement starts with dialogues like this, okay? And so um, we can engage through, with, through our NGO community and, and, and then with us, and this is a big part of the relationship that we have in, in inviting outside groups in. So I just want for everybody listening, that starts here in every dialogue that we have, that stakeholder engagement, okay? And I think at some point we'll have to have a Let's Talk Sustainability where we just focus on engagement, okay? because that sounds like it's fluffy. It is not. But projects have been killed because engagement hasn't happened well. Whole communities felt like they were left in the cold. And there are so many examples. And I love the fact, Molly, that you brought that up. And so, so knowing that, I'm going to let Marie Kekebeck, who is our stakeholder engagement leader in the company, ask the last question. What do you think are the key items that we as individuals can do to make a difference in seeing a just transition occur? So mindful, we only have a minute and a half, uh, just a few seconds of final thoughts before we wrap this up. All right, lightning round. Daniel, go. Lightning round, um, be willing to change. 
based on what you hear from people who are affected. Right. Awesome point. Alan. I'll go. I'll go back one step. Be willing to listen. Okay. Uh, there's sure there's some misinformation out there held by some of these groups, but come from the position that what they're saying they earn they fervently believe in and that they have a lot of validity for the beliefs that they hold. Excellent points, excellent points. Molly, you get to close down. <laughs> uh, so maybe just to kind of summarize, I agree totally with what Daniel and Alan said. Uh, there's a difference between stakeholder engagement and stakeholder persuasion. You don't come to a meeting just to convince everybody what you already thought was right. Um, engagement is is about listening and about being open minded to a different perspective and, and to solutions that maybe you hadn't considered before. So uh, definitely want to kind of just double down on what Daniel and Alan said. Excellent. Those are really good snapshots. You guys are really good at the lightning round. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to everybody who stayed on the whole time. Thanks for participating in it. And for those who are going to watch this asynchronously, uh, uh, appreciate you as well. And to our three guests today and and RFF for being such a fantastic uh, partner in, in exploring the just transition with us. Thanks so much. We'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks.